Hey, how you guys doing? Jeremy Nelson here with the Fire and Glory Outpouring and uh, Elisha Revolution Ministries. And I'm excited to fill you in on what we have for you this next week. Uh, we're actually taking a week break from the outpouring from April 12th to the 16th. Summit Church, who has uh, so graciously allowed us to host the outpouring at their place every night. They are needing the building to do an Easter production this week. So uh, we're going to take a one week break. And then after that, we are going to come back. And, uh, you know, April 19th, we start back up. And uh, in the meantime, though, we've got some really amazing stuff to share with you guys. We actually have uh, some schools that we've been developing behind the scenes. And we're going to give you a sneak peek of a school on angels that we've developed. Many of you have watched our show on Sid Roth concerning the angels. Well, listen, we have uh, a series that's never been released before. Uh, every night on the normal time, 7 o'clock, when we would normally start the outpouring for the week that we're off, you're going to be able to watch the episodes and learn more in, in the series. You're going to learn about the different kinds of angels. You're going to learn how to encounter them. You're going to learn the different functions that uh, are involved with the angelic realm, how to position yourself for encounters. And uh, so listen, we're going to have that week off, but you're going to still be able to uh, get some good stuff from our YouTube channel and from the outpouring. Uh, and then we're back. Like I said, once again, uh, the, the outpouring will be live every night, 7 p.m. And then right after that, we have our next Fresh Awakening Conference, and we've got some amazing speakers lined up. Charlie Robinson from Canada is going to be with us again. He spoke at our one year, and, and it was amazing. We also have uh, Robert Henderson, really cares an awesome teaching on the courtrooms of heaven, the justice of God. Listen, if you guys want a sneak peek, you can look through our archives. You can see them in the uh, older uh, YouTube clips if you just click on the YouTube channel. And then there's also myself and Miranda and Andrew Hopkins are going to be there as well. There you have it. Have a wonderful Easter break and uh, enjoy the, the sneak peek of these videos that we're going to be releasing. And uh, also, I just want to make mention, we have our brand new Elisha Revolution app. And if you haven't downloaded that, you should download it. You can go into the App Store, both on Android or iOS for your uh, iPhones. You can download it there. It's a really cool way to stay connected with us and, and also to uh, review all of the Encounter Nights, the Fresh Awakening conferences. We've actually got in their archives where you can look at all the guest speakers' teachings and videos that's uploaded in there. And, and so you'll be able to access everything from that place. Well, anyway, bless you guys. Have an amazing Easter break. And we will see you back April 19th for our Encounter Night when we return. All right, welcome back, guys. Session number three. And uh, last week we talked about uh, different kinds of angels. We talked about guardian angels, watchers. We talked about the fiery angels. Uh, we talked about joy angels. Uh, we covered a whole lot of different uh, types of angels from Gabriel to uh, Michael, the warring angels. And um, anyway, this week what we're going to do is we're going to continue on the line of different kinds of angels, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, some of the angels around what I call the throne zone, and uh, we're going to look at some of the heavenly beings and more uncommon angels that aren't necessarily taught on or talked about a lot. And uh, so we're going to we're going to look at you know angels like the living creatures that are around the throne of God. We're going to look at the um, you know the the different angels that you read about. Um, you know, like the the angels that are like fiery chariots and horses like uh, Elijah and Elisha saw. And we're going to look at martyr angels, financial angels. And, and for some of you, even as you're hearing me say this, you're, you're thinking in your head like, whoa, what did he just say? I've never even heard of these kinds of angels. Well, they're in the Bible. They're, um, there's revelation God wants to teach us concerning these things. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to start out right in the throne zone, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, I want to look at the living creatures. And um, anyway, the living creatures, are a description of them are found in Revelations 4, 6 through 11. It says, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. 
The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they did not rest day or night, but cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and cast their crown, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and power and you are created or for you um, created all things and your will by that they exist and so I want you to see this because what we have is a description of some angelic beings called the living creatures and these are one of the most mystical creatures that we find in the Bible but they're angels that surround the throne the Bible says that they're full of eyes and they're full of wings and I want to just say this is, uh, you know, just like I talked about the watcher angels, you know, Psalm uh, 103.20, it says that the angels of the Lord watch over the word of the Lord to perform it. I believe that it is quite possible that these uh, four living creatures are the watcher angels over the throne room of God. That's why they have eyes all over their bodies from the top to the bottom. And uh, I, I believe that one of their functions is to watch the throne room of heaven. And, uh, and, and so there's, there's a lot of really cool things about these angels that we can point out. It says that um, they have eyeballs all over them. They have wings. And, and it also says that these angels have four different faces. It says that one angel has a face like a lion, one like an ox, one like a flying eagle, and one like a man. And so I want to talk about these different uh, faces of these angelic beings because I believe that each face represents a different aspect of the Godhead. Um, I believe that as seers, they reflect what they see. There's, a, there's a, a principle here that I want you to learn. What you behold, you become like. Uh, what you gaze upon, you empower. What you focus on, you empower. That's why earlier uh, in the last couple of sessions, I talked about if all you focus on is the devil and, and demonic, then you'll empower that in your life. But if you focus on the king of the kingdom, if you focus on Jesus, then you'll begin to reflect who he is and the nature of your life will be changed and you'll begin to look like him. And I believe that these watchers in heaven, as they behold the king, as they behold God, they begin to reflect who he is. And each of these faces reflect a different aspect of who Jesus is. And, uh, and, and, and it's amazing because some theologians actually believe that each one of the faces of these angels, um, of these living creatures, actually represent one of the gods gospels of the four gospels that are out there and uh, you know the face of the ox is believed uh, to represent the book of Mark and it's uh, believed that um, you know it, it's to represent the servant of all mankind and, and I want to just say this that the face of the ox represents uh, Jesus as the the suffering servant and how many know that Jesus was born in a manger. Where is that? The very place where an ox puts his face to eat is where Jesus was born. He wasn't born in a luxurious hospital or hotel or somewhere noble in a, uh, a king's castle. He was born in a humble place in a ox's manger, right where uh, you know the ox would put his face to feed. And, uh, and, and part of that, I believe, is metaphorical. And how many know that Jesus actually called himself um, the ox in some ways, if you think about his teachings? How many know that Jesus said, uh, come all onto me who's heavy, uh, you know, burden and and, and find rest. He said this, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, he's talking in the context of, uh, of the ox. How many know that it's the ox that carries the burden and the yoke and, and that the yoke goes on an oxen to, uh, to carry heavy loads? And, and so Jesus is, uh, you know, the ox. And, and I believe that one of these living creatures, their face represents that aspect of who God is because they're watchers, they see him and, and, and they reflect who he is, what they focus on, uh, they manifest. And, and, and so Jesus is the, uh, the suffering servant of mankind. He represents humility. And so the face of the ox represents the humility of God. And, um, and, and I want to look at some of these other ones. Like I was saying earlier, I believe that each one of the faces of the living creatures represent an aspect of, of who God is. And, and some theologians, uh, they believe that it represents um, one of the four gospels. And so the lion 
The lion is said to have uh, represented the book of Matthew, which is the, the, the book that has the most teaching on the kingdom of God. How many know that Jesus is the king of the kingdoms? Well, well what is the lion? The lion is the king of the jungle. He's the king of all uh, that is out there. How many know that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah? And, and I want to just say this, is uh, that one of the aspects of who God is, is that he is the king of the kingdom of God. And when we focus on the king of the kingdom, then all of a sudden the nature of the lion of of the tribe of Judah uh, begins to uh, manifest in our lives. And, 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 and so um, that's what the face of the lion represents. That's what it means. I believe it, it represents the, the book of Matthew. Now, how about the eagle? Right? It said that one of these living creatures had a face like that of a flying eagle. Well, uh, many theologians believe that the, the eagle represents the book of uh, John. How many know that John is the book that records the prophetic ministry of Jesus? You know, it's where he prophesied, where he turned the water to wine, where people would often say to Jesus that he was a prophet. And uh, there's, there's more of the prophetic aspect of Jesus in the book of John than any other their place, and so therefore, one of God's um, you know faces, one of the uh, the ways that God portrays Himself is like an eagle, the prophetic anointing, and 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 so I believe that. Um, you know, those living creatures, they're, they're beholding what they're seeing. And, and part of who Jesus is, is he's, he's the prophetic. And, uh, and, and so then the fourth face is the face that looks like a man. And uh, theologians believe that this uh, represents the book of Luke. Because the book of Luke, you find more about the humanity of Jesus in that book than any of the other books. And, uh, you know, it's his teachings on, on uh, humility and servanthood. And, 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 you know, in the book of Luke, it's a whole different perspective from the other Gospels, and, and, uh, and, and you see the humanity of Christ in that place where he teaches on family, and he talks about humanity, and, 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 and so uh, I, I want to just say this, is that these living creatures that are around the throne that cry out day and night, they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I, I believe that um, they reflect aspects of who God is, because what they behold, uh, you know, they become, and... Um, Here's another interesting thing to think about, and uh, you know, uh, this is very interesting, is that one of the functions that many believe uh, the living creatures have in heaven is also that they lead heavenly worship. And, and you can see this, I read about this, where it says that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne forever and forever, it says the 24 elders then fall down on their knees and they begin to cast their crowns and they begin to worship God. And so, um, so many believe that one of the functions of these four living creatures is not only to watch over the throne and, and not only to behold God and reflect who he is, but also that they would lead worship in heaven. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, many believe that these four living creatures actually took Satan's place as worship leader in heaven because we all know because of the book of Ezekiel that God created Satan as uh, a worshiper. And what's really interesting about it is um, it, it tells us in, you know, uh, Ezekiel, it, it tells us that uh, Satan actually was created with pipes and organs, uh, an, like an organ, um, you know, uh, an instrument instrument of praise. And, and, and I want to just say this, is that when he fell out of heaven, um, you know, when he was deceived and, and fell, he took a third of the angels with him. But also, uh, many believe that, that it's possible that these four living creatures that surround the throne of God with, with uh, wings and, and eyeballs all over them, uh, that have these different faces, and, and as they worship, all of heaven worships with them, it's very possible that God set these angels on watch, not only to watch over the throne room, but also to lead the worship of heaven. And, and so I love when we start to talk about this stuff, because God wants to demystify the things of the supernatural, and he wants to make them natural to us. And he wants us to begin to uh, not only know the things of God by head knowledge, but also by heart knowledge. And, and so 
Let's look at some other um, different angels that we find in the Bible, even more uncommon ones. How about the chariots of fire? Uh, you know, uh, it tells us in 2 Kings chapter 2, 11 through 13, when Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind to heaven, it says that uh, a chariot of, of fire, a, a chariot that's, that's a, a fire and horses comes in between Elisha and Elijah as he's taken up. And, and uh, when Elisha sees it, he even cries out, you know, the chariot's of God. I'll read it to you so you see this um, in, in 2 Kings 2, you know, 11 through 13. And as he sees the chariots of fire, the mantle of Elijah falls from heaven and becomes his. But it says this, then it happened as they continued to talk on that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took a hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. So he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and stood by the banks of the Jordan. And so here we are. We have an interesting portion of scriptures where it talks about these angels that are like horsemen and, and, and chariots of fire. And I want to just look at this for a second, and I want to demystify this. What are the purpose of chariots of fire and, and angelic beings that manifest themselves like this? Well, I believe that the purpose is just like it was in the natural. And uh, I want to just say this. I think that a lot of the things that we have on earth that have been created are actually heaven's design first. And what happened is God gave the dream to someone and someone created what was already in heaven and manifested it down here. And, uh, you know, in the times of the Bible, in the days of the Bible, the kings of old, especially in the book of Exodus and, you know, way back, even in Moses' time, they created the chariots. And I'll tell you what they created them for. They created them for war. And not only for war, but they created them so that captains, kings, people of uh, nobility, people of importance could get in and out of places very quickly or very swiftly in times of, of needing to get away or, or get somewhere. And, and so I believe that these chariots of fire, these horsemen of fire, uh, they, they carry the same function. And, and what they do is they, they help for, um, for swift travel to happen, even in the spirit. And I want to just say this, Elijah was a man who was known to be transported. And, and it tells us in, you know, 1 Kings um, chapter 18, 8 through 12, Elijah had an encounter with one of the king uh, Ahab's men. And, and when he had an encounter with them, he said, go get the king and tell him I'm here. And, and it was so funny because the king, his servant got upset and he said, great, who, what have I done to sin against God that you've appeared to me? And, and everybody knows about you, Elijah. When I go tell the king, the Spirit of the Lord will take you from one place and put you on another mountaintop and, and you'll disappear. There's not any place my, my Lord has not searched for you. And, and so he had this reputation of being transported. And well, I believe that those chariots of fire, those angels of fire, uh, the horsemen and angels of fire, I believe that their purpose and, and their anointing was to transport people supernaturally. And, and, and what's interesting about that is in the very moment when Elijah is taken up to heaven in the whirlwind being transported from earth to heaven, what happens? The chariots of fire show up. And you know what's interesting is it could possibly be that not only did um, Elisha receive the mantle of Elijah as far as the anointing goes, but he might have even received the angelic realm that was with Elijah because you know what's interesting is later on when you look in the scriptures in 2 Kings chapter 6, 13 through 15, you actually see where Elisha is confronted by the king of Syria's army outside of his home. And you see um, that Elisha's servant is outside. He sees the king's armies come. He's definitely afraid. He runs in and he tells Elisha, what are we going to do? We're going to die. The king's army is here. And, and you know what Elisha does? Just real calmly, he looks at the, the servant. And he says, Lord, open his eyes to see. And when he says that, his spiritual eyes open, and all of a sudden now he's aware of the chariots of fire and their horsemen that are in the sky, and they far outnumber any of the um, natural horsemen and chariots, and, and all of a sudden, I would imagine, all fear went away. But why do you think those chariots of fire were there? I believe they were there 
Because if the, the Syrian army would have tried to attack uh, Elisha, I'm telling you, I believe they would have transported him out of there. And just like his uh, spiritual father had a testimony of, of being untouchable, and every time someone tried to get him, the Spirit of the Lord would catch him up and put him on top of another mountain. I think it's possible that those angels of fire, those chariots of fire, would have transported him from one place to another, and the armies of the natural wouldn't have been able to touch him. And therefore, that's why, I, I'm not saying that I know this for sure, but that's why I'm saying it could be that not only did Elijah uh, pass on the mantle that he carried on his life for the supernatural and power of God, but it could be also that the angelic realm that was assigned to Elijah's life was passed on then to Elisha. And I'll tell you, we've, we've had some interesting testimonies of, of transportation in our ministry. Um, I've physically been transported four times on different occasions where, um, where we were traveling in cars or from one location to another supernaturally. We were transported. But I've also had people testify of being transported. I remember one time I was preaching in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and there was a church that I was ministering with there and... As I was ministering there, there was a, a, a man in the region who didn't like our ministry. He didn't like the supernatural, didn't like the signs and wonders, and he actually spoke against us and told everybody that we were a false prophet and not to come to the meetings, and, and, and for months he had told people to stay away. Well, how many know that never works? Everybody in the whole city came out to the meetings. And, and you know, anyway, the guy didn't come, but the first night the pastor told me, yeah, this guy's been talking against me, he's been talking against you, they hate you, and, and he calls you a false prophet, and I thought, man, what did I do to this guy? And this is what I've discovered, is the religious spirit hates God. So when God is alive on the inside of you and he's moving in you and around you and the supernatural is taking place, don't be offended when people don't like you. Just bless them and move on. And so that's what we did that night. I, I prophesied. I, I, you know, I, I felt the Lord tell me, pray for that man, that he would have a Saul of Tarsus-like encounter publicly. Pray for him that, that this would happen and, and make a decree that I'd release the spirit and power of Elijah in his life. So at the end of the meeting, I stood up and, and I began to prophesy. I said, God is going to release the Saul of Tarsus-like encounters to people in this region who hate the supernatural, who don't like the Spirit of God. And I said, they're going to have Elijah-like experiences in Jesus' name. I prophesied it. And then we closed the meeting and, uh, you know, we went home. But there was this amazing testimony the next night because that night when I had prophesied this encounter, there was the man that had been speaking evil against us, didn't like us being in the city. He actually was driving um, from another city back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and when him and his car full of buddies hit the county line, it was exactly, um, you know, probably like five or ten minutes after I had prophesied the prophecy, um, all of a sudden, as they were driving in their car, it was around 11, uh, you know, 30-something, they hit the county line, two chariots of fire in the natural came on each side of of his car, and, and I'm telling you, these guys fell into a trance, they went to heaven, and when they came out of the trance, it was minutes later, they were supernaturally transported um, over 40 miles to the other side of town, and when they came out of the experience, they took note on the clock that they had gone, you know, um, over 40 miles in just a few minutes' time, and they came to the meeting the next night to repent. And they repented publicly uh, to the pastor and to myself of, of speaking evil against God and against the supernatural. But I wanted to share that testimony, uh, uh, number one, because it's an awesome testimony about how God can change religious people's hearts if we just love on them. Listen, we don't need to fight against them. Just pray for them, that God would encounter them, that they would be switched on like Saul did, where they go from Saul to Paul. But number two, it, uh, it was a testimony that showed when the chariots of fire and the horsemen show up, transportation happens. And so we've seen it even in the natural. And, and that's why I don't believe it's a theory. I believe that this is something that, that, that God does. And so if, if you ever need, um, you know, transportation, ask God, Lord, send the chariots of fire and, you know, the supernatural and, and, and you know, in instances where people are transported, I mean, Jesus was transported in the Bible. You know, it, it tells us all over the place that he was transported. And, um, you know, I remember when he walked on water and, you know, it says that his disciples, were straining at the oars. They were halfway across the Sea of Galilee. And after he walked on water and Peter walked on water, it says immediately when he stepped into the boat, they were on the other side. 
So they got transported immediately. Well, I don't know if our eyes were open spiritually and we were there on that day. Who knows? We might have seen the chariots of fire with Jesus. But, but my point is this, is we want to demystify the things of the supernatural. I want to get you thinking. I want to get you reading your Bible. I want to get you uh, to challenge your, uh, your intellect, but look for the scriptures because the word and the spirit go hand in hand. And so now I want to talk about um, some other encounters, you know, uh, that, that we've seen. Um, how about financial angels? That's not something that you hear about all the time. But I've had many encounters where the Lord has blessed me and he's uh, taken me into encounters where I've seen the treasure rooms of heaven. And, you know, in the, the book of Matthew... It tells us, you know, Jesus, he said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, you know, rust and moth cannot um, destroy or a thief cannot break in and steal from. He said, where your heart is, there your treasures will also be. And I've had several times where God took me in encounters to the treasure rooms of heaven. And I remember one time he took me and I went and I, I saw the treasury of God. How many know that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? And listen, I want you to hear this. Um, Jesus uh, is a king. Have you ever heard of a, a poor king? No. Have you ever, uh, listen, what king doesn't have treasure, right? And, and here's one thing I want to say to you. Jesus said to his people, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where rust and moth cannot destroy, thief can't steal and break in and take from you, but where your heart is, your treasures are also. And I remember when I was actually writing my book on encountering angels. By the way, if you want a good book on angels, get it. It's come out and you can get it on amazon.com, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about. But, but I remember when I was writing that book, God took me into the treasure room of heaven. I saw silver and gold as far as the eyes could see. I saw the treasury room of heaven for miles. I could see God's treasure. And, and, and all of a sudden in this encounter, an angel appeared next to me. And I said, who are you? And he said, I am the angel uh, that is uh, the minister of finances over heaven. And I oversee the treasury rooms. And he said, God has sent you here because he wants me to show you how it works. And so I remember I took his hand. And when I took his hand, we began to soar and fly over the treasury room. And as we began to soar, it was like for miles we flew. And, and I could see silver and gold and properties and lands and all kinds of things in this treasury room. And, and, and it was amazing. And, and, and all of a sudden, we came to another place in heaven where I saw probably millions of rooms and there were all these different rooms with different you know, amounts of treasure in them and they had people's names on them. And, and I said to the angel, where are we now in this vision? And he said, we're in the treasure rooms of the people who live on earth. And the Lord spoke to me. The Holy Spirit said, Jeremy, just like every man, woman, and child has a bank account in the natural on earth, so do they in heaven. And he said, listen, according to people's generosity of heart, in obedience to what I tell them to do. He says it accumulates treasure in heaven for them. And he said, every time someone is obedient, every time somebody follows me and, and, and does what I say when I say to do it, and they sow finances, they reap up here. He said, when they do things generous on the earth, they reap up here. And the angels of heaven bring the treasury from my treasury and they put them in their treasuries and they manifest on the earth. And I'm telling you, I remember when, when I saw this, I said, God, uh, how does this work? And he showed me an encounter. He, he let me see a transaction. He let me see how it worked. And I saw this woman who's praying by her bedside. She was worshiping the Lord. And she said, God, I need financial breakthrough. And, and, and the Lord spoke to her. I watched him. He appeared to her. She didn't even know he was next to her. He spoke in her ear. And, and she could hear his voice but not see him. And, and he said, if you'll give the little that you have to your neighbor... I'll bless you with what you need. And this woman said, anything for you. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. And, and I knew that she gave, it was like I, I supernaturally knew that she gave all she had to the neighbor and it wasn't much. And then all of a sudden, as I, I saw this prayer and this response, boom, all of a sudden we're back in heaven and I watched this angel grab a massive amount of treasure and he takes it from the treasury of the Lord and he puts it in this woman's treasury box. And as he does, it, it, it goes, whoom, and it shoots it down into the earth and, and it's like now the scene changes and I can, I can see the transaction for, forward, um, you know, fast forward happening and a man walks up to her and he says, God told me to give you this and he gives her a thousand dollars. And she, she says, thank you, Jesus. I can pay my rent. I can buy my groceries. And, you know, as I saw that, I began to realize that it's out of obedience that it moves the angels of heaven to release finances. Philippians 4.19 says that God will uh, supply all of our needs out of his riches in glory. 
Listen, God, God has all the treasure that we need. Did you realize that in heaven, uh, his, his heavenly realm, is, uh, his heavenly city, the, the, the asphalt is made of gold? I mean, listen, we think of finances differently than God does. It's different from his perspective. Uh, and, and, and he has all the gold and all the silver you need. There's financial angels that he wants to send on assignment. But the way it works is, here's how it works. Seek first his righteousness and his kingdom, and all else will be given to you. And, and as we begin to, out of obedience, give, it moves the angels of heaven to bring financial breakthrough to us. And, and, and it releases visitations. It releases the glory of God. And, and some of you here are saying, well, where's that at in the Bible? How about Cornelius? See, the Bible says that his prayers and his financial giving, his alms to the poor, came before God as a memorial in heaven. Did you know that we have a treasury room in heaven that we can build a memorial in heaven that God looks at and causes him to release blessing to us through? And it says that because of his prayer, his intimacy, and his obedience to God to follow him, and, and because of his giving, it says an angelic visitation was released that all of his household would be saved. And I want to just say this, is that the angels of heaven are on assignment to release the treasuries of heaven, and it's not always money. It's not always finances that we reap when we sow. Sometimes it's wisdom. Sometimes it's revelation. Sometimes it's dreams and encounters with God. It says in the book of Colossians that in Jesus Christ is hidden all the true treasures of wisdom and revelation concerning the Father. And, and, and so anyway, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there. But there's angels on assignment from heaven to bring finances to be released to us. And, and, and uh, I, we have testimonies of, of supernatural breakthrough with finances. And, 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 and so um, I want to just pray for you guys. We're going we're gonna to look at more of this in the next session, but we're also going to look at the function of the angels in the next session. And, and we're going to look more even into this realm of the finances in a minute. But I want to pray for you. We'll run out of time for this session, but I want to pray for you that God would activate um, you to begin to uh, see into the realm of heaven, to have encounters with the the living creatures to begin to um, experience, you know, uh, these these different realms like transportations and translations, and and I want to pray that God would begin to open the Bible to the Bible to you and that you would begin to experience, um, you know, on earth as it is in heaven and, and, and that you would worship with heaven. How many know that if there's, uh, there's living creatures who lead worship in heaven and, and heaven is to invade earth, how many know we can join in with the living creatures? We can join in with the angels that are worshiping r around the throne. We can join in with the 24 elders who cast their crowns and we can worship with them. Now that's a new thought on heaven invading earth, isn't it? How many know that it's not just heaven invading earth with miracles or heaven invading earth? earth with finances, but it's actually we join with heaven on earth as it invades, and we worship the king. How many know that Jesus, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, is enthroned on the praises of his people? And so I'm telling you, God wants to open the reality of heaven to you, and he wants you to join with the angels in worship today. He wants you to join with heaven uh, as they worship the king of glory, because that's what it's about. And so, Father, I thank you for those that are taking this course, and I pray for impartation, that, Lord, they would have encounters, Lord, even with the realm of the uh, heavenly beings and the uncommon angels that we're talking about, that, Lord, you'd release encounters, that people would get taken to the throne of heaven, and that, Lord, they would see the, the things of the, the, the heavenly realm and that they would enter into worship with all of eternity to, towards the King of glory, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.